Okay, so that should be showing my uh, PowerPoint right there. Uh, thanks everybody for logging in. Um, as she mentioned, I'll be talking about the design of a post tension straddle beam. Uh, my name is Drew Downmuir. I'm with Wilson and Company down here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, all right, so just an overview of what um, I'll be discussing. Uh, start off with a quick introduction, kind of why I'm doing this and what you can expect to get from it. Um, description of the bridge that I did this work on. Uh, the design of the straddle beam by spreadsheet. Uh, talk about it a little bit, um, some various points, and actually uh, open it up and show you that spreadsheet. Um, then I'll talk about the design of the straddle beam using Midas Dibble. Um, and at the end, we'll take a look at um, how the results came out. Uh, true. It's a little bit difficult to hear you clearly, so um, if you can get a little closer to uh, the phone or the mic, or if you can raise volume a little bit, that will be really helpful. Okay, will do. Sorry about that. Yeah, it's much better right. now. <laughs> um, all right, so um, by way of introduction, um, so what can you expect to get from this presentation? So. Uh, hopefully, you can gain some greater insight into the use of construction, construction stages in Midas Civil. Um, maybe some considerations for the design and modeling of a post tension member built in stages. How to include various parameters in Midas Civil, including post tension losses. Um, and I'll mention some of the different uh, boundary conditions and member types that I used. Um, and how to ensure that locked in stresses are properly carried through. Um, in addition to that, um, these webinar series, you can get a, a PDH credit for attending. All right, so now the bridge. Um, this bridge carries uh, State Highway 92 over the Union Pacific Railroad near Delta, Colorado. Um, originally, this was an at-grade crossing um, to improve flow through that area and safety. Um, DOT decided to bring the highway over the railroad. Um, the superstructure we ended up with was a four-span pre-stress girder superstructure. The end spans were 130 feet. The uh, middle spans were 150 feet each. Um, we used seven Colorado BT-63 girders, simple for dead, continuous for live, and superimposed bed load. Our deck width was 43 feet out to out, 40 feet of out available to, um, for the travel way, so we had foot and a half barriers on each side. We used reinforced concrete sub abutments on driven steel piles behind MSC walls uh, for the abutments on either side. Piers 2 and 4 were a uh, fairly common type, uh, reinforced concrete columns and pier cap on reinforced concrete caisson. And Pier 3 is the one that uh, this webinar focuses on. So it's, we had reinforced concrete uh, caissons and columns. Uh, but the straddle beam was a post tension member. The straddle beam allowed for um, getting adequate clearance over the railroad while minimizing the required earthwork and retaining walls. Since we were building up from an at grade crossing from nothing, um, any uh, amount we could cut down on the structure depth helped uh, reduce the overall earthwork that was required and the MSC walls that were required. Uh, so here's just a plan view. i uh, talk about that real quick. So we have um, our embankments on either side, um, our typical piers two and four here. Those were the reinforced concrete um, uh, superstructures or substructures. Um, here, the center pier is the one that we're focusing on. So this spans over the railroad. Um, and the thing that kind of drove the need for this is this uh, high skew with respect to the highway. So the distance over which we need to uh, span over the railroad was pretty significant. Plus, they have their, uh, they require their vertical clearance uh, 25 feet to either side of the track. Here's a, a, a profile of the bridge uh, showing our span length, as I mentioned before, 130 feet for the end spans, 150 feet for those middle spans, um, showing our abutments, the piers two and four, and our straddle beam. 
just watch on that one. Um, in terms of typical section, here's one at one of the conventional piers. Uh, so this our cross slope. Uh, it varies at the end of the bridge. Uh, we have a spiral curve that starts on the bridge. Uh, there wasn't enough room to push that off. Um, and as a result of that, we also warped the cross slope. So it's kind of interesting working with that and getting the um, getting the um, ponches and the bridge geometry to all work out with that. Um, we had an eight foot deck, and um, this is kind of the layout of our piers two and four. And then in this on this side, it shows us pier three. So this is our post tension straddle beam. Um, we pretty well centered this bridge on that straddle beam, making, uh, I guess, maximizing our clearance over that railroad. Uh, that's pretty much it there. We had four foot columns and 60 inch caissons um, below the, um, the straddle beam there. Plan view of the straddle beam were seven feet wide. The middle stem was three foot two inches wide. The wedges on which the beam sat were one foot 11 inches um, uh, wide and uh, two feet thick at minimum. Um, so here we have these end blocks were poured um, at the beginning. Um, this is where we have our um, anchored zone. So this is fairly heavily reinforced in here and in here. And we wanted to uh, minimize any construction joints we had going on in there. So we didn't maintain the T-shape all the way across the inverted T-shape. Um, this was all poured together. Okay, our total length was 62 feet. Our span length from center column to center column was 57 feet. And here's an elevation of the post tension straddle beam. Again, our two foot minimum for the bottom slab, although it does get uh, thicker. Um, built up grout pads to make sure they're hitting the elevation right to set these girders. Um, at the top of these columns, we tried to make this act as much as a pin as we could. So we have expansion joint material here and here. Same thing on the other side. Um, and for most of the length of the straddle beam, it uh, kept the same slope as the deck of the bridge at 4% cross slope. Um, but then once we got to the exterior girder, we flattened it out. So this is horizontal to the earth. Um, and that's just to keep water from wanting to sit on that deck edge. Uh, here's the reinforcing of the straddle beam. Um, so up here shows our stirrups. Down here is our ledge reinforcing. Um, we had steel coming out of the column. You'll be able to see where that's coming in a little better on the next sheet. Um, and then just um, reinforcing through the diaphragm. Here you can see where the post tension ducts are at the end and at the middle. Um, so you can see how those kind of vary along the length of the, of the member. Um, down here we can see a top view of that end section where we have all the anchorage devices and um, that reinforcing coming up from the column and the bursting steel and all that. So it's uh, fairly congested in there. So that's why we drew it out to make sure everything was uh, fitting in there well. Um, at the top of the column, we had some bars coming out the top. Uh, we wanted it to act as a pin um, for the straddle beam portion, but perpendicular to that, uh, we were wanting to resist those moments. So we put those as close to the uh, center of the column as we could and uh, buttered them up to resist all those moments. So that's the uh, acting in you know, this thing wanting to turn to torsion and for the longitudinal loads of the um, of traffic. 
All right, so at the time of design, uh, Midas license was not consistently available to me. Um, I had a colleague who was working on doing some seismic modeling um, in the software. So I ended up performing the design using a large spreadsheet. Uh, the spreadsheet consisted of one tab for each construction stage, including steps for adding new structural components, aging the concrete, and the placing of additional loads. Uh, this was necessary to ensure that the lost in stresses were correctly accounted for. Um, so whatever load you put on the base structure before we add in the diaphragms or the deck, that's going to cause a higher um, stress in that member than if you had these other things added in. Um, and that stress is going to be locked in once these other uh, elements of the straddle beam become uh, composite. Um, so to account for that, had to go through and work the construction stages. This allowed for developing a better estimate of uh, post fence mosses as well um, over time, making sure that those were acting on the appropriate section and uh, making sure that they were calculated correctly by using the correct cross section. Um, a summary sheet was also created. Um, from this sheet, um, I could adjust various parameters. Um, so that was very useful during the design. I could change the profile of the post tension uh, tendons. I could change the number of strands within the ducts. <clears throat> and I could change the um, longitudinal mild seal that was running through there. Because um, I did rely on that. I <coughs> uh, did rely on that a little bit um, to keep the stresses down in the number. Uh, the creation of the spreadsheet was very involved um, and required a significant time investment. So um, I'd say that took uh, a few weeks uh, putting that together. Um, not necessarily that, that was a bad thing. Um, but I definitely learned a lot about um, post-tensioning and um, thought about some things that I probably wouldn't have uh, thought of as deeply had I just thrown this directly into the software. Um, but uh, next time around, I am definitely going to use my civil. Uh, we'll say that. Um, once completed, um, my spreadsheet facilitated design well since adjustments could be made from the summary tab making it rel relatively simple to determine required post tension quantity and tendon path. So like I said, I could adjust those things from the, um, from the summary screen, and my stresses would be updated automatically. Uh, once the design was established, there were some aspects of the calculations that I, I needed to verify and adjust, um, such as uh, friction losses and anchor set, but mainly the anchor set um, when I was changing the uh, profile of the tendon. Um, because these were not programmed to update automatically. All right, so now we'll take a look at the actual spreadsheet. So here is that summary sheet. So the way it's laid out, I have compressive stresses in this section, tensile stresses here, and the strength calculation uh, summary here. Um, it's laid out by um, location within the member. So bottom of slab, top of slab, top of diaphragm, and top of deck, basically. And then it's laid out with all of the 13 construction stages. Um, the reason this, these numbers here are red, uh, usually not a good thing to see on a final spreadsheet, but um, the stage one is kind of a um, maybe a fictitious kind of stage. Um, that's assuming that all of the tendons are being jacked simultaneously, so that's not real. Uh, so once you step over to stage two, that's you know once uh, anchor set has occurred for all of them. So you know worst case, in reality, you're going to have eight of these are going going to have um, set. You know you're going to have your anchor set. They're going to be um, uh, have that in place already, and then one is the last one will be jacked. All right, so um, you can see this basically this pulls um, the numbers from these bigger spreadsheets so that you can overview everything real quickly. Over here on the side, these are the parameters that I can change. So I can change the number of strands per duct in tendons one and two. So you know I can change that. And okay, I'm overstressed in tension over here. And I can change the profile. So you know, if I change that, 
then I'm getting overstressed in compression over here. So I can play. I was able to uh, change those as appropriate to get a final design, and then work through and make sure um, everything updated correctly. Um, so we'll take a quick look at one of the or a couple of these um, different cheats for the different stages. So this cheat shows stages uh, one and two. So uh, stage one is everything jacked completely, um, you know, to their highest stress. Stage two is after anchor set has occurred for <coughs> all of the tendons. Um, up here at the top, we have the length. We have, um, you know, this list gets longer um, as we go through the stages. Um, we have approximate uh, lengths of time. Uh, between the different stages. Uh, over here we even have our tendon properties, so the amount of um, area of strands in the different groups. We have our mild steel in these three sections. Um, and then we have the properties of the slab and stem portion. Um, then at the end blocks there's another calc uh, for those that is ran a little separate. Um, and then we have the parameters here for including the steel as a um, transform section. Here's material properties, the weight of the uh, member at the stage, the length, the uh, span length, and then it comes down here to calculations. So as we work from left to right, uh, we have the locations, the node numbers that were used in RC peer. I used that to grab my live loads and design the columns. Um, and member from RC peer, um, self weight moment. And then, you know, this section is for showing the path of the uh, tendon. Here's the gross properties as we go across the member. Um, and that is the transform section. So once the tendons are grouted, um, that those transform sections change um, continuously along the length of the member. Then we come over here. We um, show what's going on with the post tensioning. So what's our PT force um, at the various locations, accounting for friction loss and ultimately accounting for um, anchor set as well had different post-tensioning groups. The uh, naming of that changed a little bit from my calculations into the drawings, but um, I knew what I meant when I was working in here, and that just got uh, transcribed over to the plans ultimately. Um, so that's that. And then here's all of the tendons together, um, the force and moment applied to the number. And then finally, the stresses. So this is that stage one, which is you know, kind of a fictitious stage. And then over here, stage two, which is um, really the first stage. So here, we're right below our limit on compression. And in tension, we have a little bit of leeway from 49 to 509. Also had strength calcs in here and deflection calcs. So a lot of different things that uh, this sheet is doing. Um, so uh, and all of this is done uh, basically automatically once you get your model into Midas Civil correctly. Um, down here is where I did all my calcs for anchor set. And that's pretty much um, what I wanted to show you in that sheet. Um, and then I had different stages. Um, I like to separate the concrete aging from adding any kind of load. So stage three is just the concrete aging until the beams are set. Um, so we add a little time. And then down here, we have our shrinkage, creep, and relaxation calculations. Those are um, incorporated into the member. And then we have a um, we have a table showing the change in the moment um, 
from the prior stage. And then whatever change we have is applied to the current section properties and added to the last stage's stresses. So as the cross-section changes, so here we have the diaphragm, um, it becomes active. Um, then those, oh, sorry, uh, we have diaphragm weight, so that's still on the base structure. Once the diaphragm is hard, then anything added thereafter is added to a bigger cross-section and therefore a smaller stress per unit moment. All right. So now we'll jump over to some of the other tabs. Um, calculated the ledge reinforcement that was required. So that requires um, the horizontal bars in the ledge itself in the bottom. Um, requires hanger bars within the stem. And that was fairly significant. Those hanger bars were carried over into the shear design. So um, going left to left, or left to right, um, all the calcs are performed. Uh, determining what the shear is, what the torsion is, um, what shear um, steel is required, if torsional steer, steel is required. And then at the end, everything is added together. Um, so we have the hanger bars, uh, steel. The shear steel is required. Add that together and figure out what the spacing needs to be. Uh, diaphragm steel. Uh, consider the positive moment that can potentially develop. Um, that's the ASHTO check for uh, members that are, for pre-tension members that are um, simple for dead and continuous for live and superimposed dead loads. Um, and then also just the calcs for um, strength and minimum steel in the diaphragm for the horizontal and vertical bars. Um, made some spreadsheets or made a spreadsheet for the anchorage design, um, getting everything ready to uh, develop a strut and tie model and solving that truss in here. Um, and then this sheet um, I put together to determine what an acceptable stretching sequence was. Um, if you've worked with post tensioning before, you know that the sequence can be uh, a uh, significant matter. You got to make sure that you're not <coughs> overstressing the member um, as you apply the post tensioning, um, which you could do if you decided to, you know, just work up one side and put in all of that post tensioning. Well, that's going to be developing um, some out of plane bending in your member, and thus adding to the stresses that it experiences. So. What I did is I put this together so that the X means that the tendon is there. And if you take that out, then it's uh, no longer showing that it's there. So once you take that one out, well, that was definitely not the last tendon we put in, because if you take that out, we get overstresses. So um, worked through this and figured out this order of stressing works without developing any overstress in any corner of this member. Uh, loads that came from our CPR uh, caisson length was calculated here. Um, and then the shear strength of the columns and caissons were checked and designed in here. All right, so now we'll jump back into the spreadsheet, and, or um, PowerPoint, sorry, and talk about doing this in Midas Civil. So that's why you're here, right? So trying to spend a little more time on this side of things. All right, so as a result of being approached to offer this webinar, um, I developed a, my, a model in Midas Civil uh, for the straddle beam. Uh, using the software, the stresses in the concrete can more easily be computed for the various construction stages um, that spreadsheet took some doing to put together and to verify and all that. Um, so. Um, once you get this in the Midas Civil, you get new same similar results, and they come a lot easier. Um, so I'll tell you that you know that spreadsheet took me a few weeks to put together. Um, in Midas Civil, you know, putting this together for the presentation, um, I put it together in I think it was four nights between when the kids went to bed and when I fell asleep on the keyboard. So that was probably about a day, day and a half of um, work 
you know, if I were to do it here in the office. Um, so again, not everything's in it, but um, you know, that's definitely a real strong start. Um, all right, so model requires entering the structural component loads and post tensioning appropriately in order to properly calculate the forces and stresses. And the, the reason I'm saying that is because the um, model I put together uses construction stages. Building the construction stages, um, you're taking different, uh, let's see, what are they called, member groups, um, I guess element groups, boundary groups, and load groups. Um, you're adding these and subtracting these in the various construction stages as you go forward. So you need to make sure that all of your elements and boundaries and loads are assigned to the appropriate um, uh, geez, group. Um, all right. So construction stages feature must be used to obtain proper calculations for creep and shrinkage and to account for your lost interests um, as uh, your various components are added. So you've got to make sure um, you're calculating stresses on the correct member as you're adding these loads. Um, as a result, you want to ensure that everything you create is in the correct group so it can be activated at the right time. And reasonable estimates uh, must be made concerning the timing of placement of all members and post tensioning. Um, and that's a little hard to do up front. Um, getting a good feel for what the contractor is actually going to do. In practice, he wants to, uh, he's generally going to want to get this thing together as fast as he can. So um, he'll be looking at the seven day breaks and see if strength has been achieved. And if so, um, if uh, schedule allows for it, he's going to move forward. So. Uh, getting a real good feel for that is difficult, so it's just a matter of making reasonable assumptions. All right, so now we'll take a look at the model. Uh, some things that I'll point out um, while we're in the model are the uh, materials, time-dependent material properties, and the sections that were used. Um, I'll show you the members, boundary conditions, loads, etc., and their corresponding groups. Um, take a look at the post-tensioning input, and a quick review of the output, uh, depending on how much time we have left. All right, so that's all I have in PowerPoint. So now we'll jump into my All right, so um, first thing you're going to do when you're putting them all together is get your properties. Um, before you create any elements, it's going to be wanting material properties and section properties. Um, so you might as well just start with these. So the ones I put in were concrete. So that's the concrete for the main member. Um, so it has its own self-weight to it and the strength and stiffness as appropriate. Um, have another material in here for the pre-stressing steel or the um, strands within the tendon. Have a rigid material. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. But it's a weightless material with a very high stiffness. Um, have a weightless concrete. So I use that for the diaphragms and the tributary portion of the deck. The um, reason I have a weightless concrete is that the load is going to be activated separately from the capacity of these members. The, the diaphragms are going to be poured. Well, they're at that point, they're just acting as a weight on the original member. They have no capacity. They have no stiffness. So um, I accounted for that by just using a line load to account for the weight of those diaphragms. And then in a later stage, I activated the actual members. Then I also have a steel defined for the mild reinforcing that ran through this main member. Then we can look at the section properties. So I have bottom and top rebar. Again, that was fairly uh, large amount of steel. Um, so those, um, those uh, rows of rebar were included in the model as composite 
to um, contribute to the essentially the transform section property of this uh, member. Then we have the block at this end. Um, so this had a constant height from the end up until we started with the inverted T portion. Then we have the typical inverted T portion up until you get to that last girder, at which point the top of the uh, shadow beam flattens out. So it's no longer a constant cross section. Um, so then we have T sections two, three, and four um, are the average height of those members um, once that uh, height is reduced moving forward. And then N block over here, it reduces in height um, from the transition from the inverted T to the end, blo end block. Um, that's constantly reducing in height. So I have five separate elements for that getting shorter from one through five. And the diaphragm, um, have a full height diaphragm. Again, goes until that last beam. And then I had a taper section in here for the end part. And then here's the tributary deck and rigid link. So just um, an arbitrary shape for that rigid link. All right. So that's that. Uh, something else I wanted to show you in the section properties is um, the fact that I used a PSD member for the main member. A um, couple things about that. Um, on this type of member, you can input the uh, reinforcing, and that can be included in your uh, spec check. So uh, that's an advantage of having that in there. Another advantage is on your output side. Um, there's more detailed output that you can get using a uh, one of the pre-stretched concrete members. Um, to make it work, though, they don't have a square uh, pre-stressed concrete member. Um, we'll open that up real quick. Get that in the right screen. Um, so um, these are your choices on the PSD tab. So you have your different box girders. You have um, basically pieces of a box girder. So this eye-looking piece would be you know this web and some portion of the slab. Then you have a typical eye girder, like a precast eye, and you have a T, um, and then also a box. So what I used in this case was a T. They don't really have an option for inverting the T here, so you just got to invert it when you put it in as a member. Um, and then for the end blocks, I rigged um, one of these box girders to be just a box. So I just put a real small circle in the middle um, for the void, and then made the edge as straight as it would let me, and um, you know, kind of faked in a rectangle there. All right. So that's that. Um, so now we'll take a look at the main member that I put in. So take away everything else and take a front view. So you can see how the height of that is decreasing as we get towards the end. Um, in reality, this thing is on a cross slope of, or you know, follows the cross slope of the bridge at 4%. So this is horizontal to the world as opposed to this. Um, but just for sake of simplicity, um, I put it as flat in here. Um, let's see, I'm just going to do that. So in here, you can see, once they take away the uh, visual of the member section, you can see the line of the elements. So I kept this line at the center of gravity of the member um, from start to finish. So because of that, and because we had an abrupt change in the cross section, um, there was a vertical gap between the end of this section and the start of this one. When putting in the post tensioning, you have to apply it to a 
continuous member. So uh, normally I would just put in a rigid link to make that act as if it were uh, connected already. Um, in this case I had to use a member um, to uh, allow for this to be continuous. Another solution would be just to um, change the offset with respect to the centroid and make this a continuous across. Um, I just have a preference for keeping the, um, the uh, node at the centroid of the member. Um, all right. So then the material that was used on the uh, main member here is, was the regular concrete. So it includes its own self-weight. Um, and that was activated immediately along with the post-tensioning in the first stage. Um, for the vertical rigid member piece, um, that's that um, uh, material property I pointed out that was called rigid. So I just put in something with a really high elastic modulus and you know reasonable size uh, cross section makes it act essentially as if it were a rigid link. Um, some other inputs in terms of properties. Um, you have creep and compressive strength um, as time dependent properties. So you can um, uh, define these and apply them to the concrete that you're using for your member. So in this case, I just used um, this model, the CEB FIP. Um, with you know, these parameters in here. Once you have that in there, it gives you a creep coefficient over time. And you can do the same thing with the strength. So you can um, use one of the models and take a look at your graph. So at 28 days, it's exactly your 28-day compressive strength. In reality, you're going to be a little better than this, but um, as engineers, we've got to make assumptions, right? Uh, okay, so that's all of our properties defined. Um, now I'll show some of the boundary conditions I put in here. Um, sorry, before I go into that, um, I'll point out the structure groups that were created. All right, so we have the base structure. So this is essentially the first pore. Uh, this portion of it was shored. You know, they had uh, shoring towers out there uh, for the formwork um, up until the post tensioning was applied. So once the post tensioning was put in, this thing lifted off, and they were able to get the uh, forms out of there. Um, so that is all in one group because that's going to be activated all at the same time in our construction stages. Then I separated out diaphragms one and two, and the tributary deck, and the rebar. So those are all uh, put in uh, at the elevation need, they need to be in. And I'll show you now <coughs> how they were attached to the member. So here we'll take a look at the base structure and the diaphragm. And we'll take a look at the uh, them to diaphragm composite uh, boundary conditions. So these are rigid links from the um, diaphragm element to the main member. So that makes it act composite with the main member. Uh, similarly, the base structure and the tributary deck can activate those and take a look at those boundary conditions. So we had rigid links acting between the main member and the tributary deck. Um, same thing with the rebar. So take a look at that. And then the rebar was attached to the member or uh, made composite with the member using these rigid links. So one rigid link from centroid or yeah, centroid of the member up to centroid of the steel and then down to the centroid of the other steel. Um, it's important that these are put into groups, as I mentioned earlier. Um, as we take a look at the construction stages, 
um, you kind of make things exist um, in these different stages. And you want to make sure that uh, you're activating what you think you're activating. So if for some reason you're missing this member in the base structure group, well then your structure has a hole in it and your results are not going to come out. Um, good thing with MySpivil is that you can um, check all this stuff visually. So you can go through your different stages um, and see how the structure gets built up as you work through them. All right. Um, the one boundary condition I didn't show you was the supports. Uh, nothing too special there. Um, just acting like they're um, uh, rigidly fixed against the things that they resist. So this is only a pin in the uh, about the axis that allows this shadow beam to be a simply supported member. Um, this one is free in more directions. Um, uh, these supports, I do have them fixed for, you know, this moment, the torsion of the straddle beam, and for, um, I guess, what would be torsion of the column. So um, those are going to give calculated forces, which you can then design for in the column. Um, so that's all those some groups. Um, quickly show some of the loads that were put in. Um, didn't do anything real fancy with that. Um, I just had my static load cases for the post tensioning tendon, and then line load representing the weight of the diaphragm, and point loads showing the weight of the girders themselves, their self-weight, and the weight of the deck. Um, and then we also had the uh, weight of the wearing surface barriers and uh, live load. Um, and then we have the self-weight, which really is only going to apply to members in the base group because those are the only ones that um, use material property that have a weight assigned to them. All right. Um, now we'll take a look at the post-tensioning input. So that's under loads. Here we'll unlock the model so we can see more. So temperature pre-stress, first thing you need to do is create tenon properties. So to do that, um, this is defining each tendon, each uh, tube full of strands, right? Um, we can define a tendon as multiple tendons later on, but here it is an individual tendon. Um, so you can define your tendon type. In this case, it was internal post-tensioning. Um, we define our material for the strand, so that's our 270 low reactivity low relaxation strand. Um, you can put in your tendon area. So it was 19.6 inch strand. Uh, there we go. Um, so you can put that in and get that 4.08 inches squared. Um, then our duct diameter, uh, relaxation coefficient, and then the strand properties, the ultimate strength and yield stress, or yield strength, and then our mu and k and anchor slip, and whether it is bonded or unbonded. Um, so a number of parameters in there that are important and need to be entered correctly. So you've got to have a good understanding of what's what. Um, and uh, you have some leeway as to um, what you want to put in there, what assumptions you want to make for relaxation. Um, so that is that window. Next thing you can do is define the profile. So tendon one, uh, cool thing about this is when you click on it, it shows up on your member so you can see what you're looking at. So there's T1, T2, and T3. 
um, T1 and T2 each contain a pair of tendons. T3 has five tendons in it. So there's five that are lower down and two that are a little higher up. Um, just to simplify the input, I use the average elevation along the length of this thing um, to represent all five tendons. All right, so if we come in and take a look at one of these, that's this top tendon. Um, does that show up on the right screen here? Um, it shows you what members it's applied to by selecting them and turning them bright red, right? Um, you up here define what group it's in. So there's a tendon group T1, and that's important because we're using construction stages. Um, you're going to use the tendon property that you defined earlier and assign your element. You can do your input as 2D or 3D, so you can assign you know, one at a time in the horizontal direction up here and the vertical direction here, or you can do that um, all as one input um, per node, essentially. Then we have a spline or a round curve. You can define how many tendons are in this tendon, quote unquote, um, that are in this tendon profile, maybe we'll say. Um, transfer length if you're doing a pre-stress type member. And then you can say whether you're doing a straight element or curved here. Um, or, yeah, sorry. Um, so you define just a straight line along the middle for uh, the horizontal, because these things are going to act basically straight. Um, and then down here, we have a vertical profile. There is a way to put your radius in there. Um, and once you come to final design, that's uh, very much a good thing to do to make sure that you know the stresses in this area are being accounted for correctly. Um, but just for the demonstration of this, I, I made it uh, straight segments connected to each other. So you're going to get a whole lot of uh, friction loss right there. It's uh, basically as if it were an, uh, an external post tension duct, right? Um, you just have your big friction loss right there and right there, and then the wobble friction throughout. Um, so that's assigned. And then you define um, where the insertion point is. So I based all of this on zero. Um, so then each of these y or z elevations are the distance from the bottom of the member. So I uh, just got to watch for how you define these, what they're relative to, and how you insert them to make sure that um, it is what you think it is. And then the final thing um, on the uh, pre-stressing side or the post-tensioning side is to look at um, this input here. So this is where you're actually uh, making sure you have a load. So um, you have your different tendon groups. You can tell it that you're applying um, post-tensioning either at the begin end or at the start or uh, finish. I guess this would be the beginning here. This would be the end here. So if you're doing two side stressing, then you would put the degree to which you're stressing on either end. And here you can put um, which side you're starting with. You can define it in terms of stress or force. Um, I chose this to put the stress in there. And then you can define each of these um, tendon profiles, these tendon groups, separately. All right, so that's post tensioning. And then now we'll take a look at the uh, construction stage input. So this is uh, uh, very important in this kind of member where you're adding to it over time and counting on um, those additional pieces for further loading. So um, here at stage one, we can uh, take a quick look. So in stage one, 
I added the base structure and the rebar. You can say how old that concrete is um, when it shows up in the model. You can define your um, boundary groups, or I'm sorry, you can activate your boundary groups. So here I'm putting in the support and the rigid length between the uh, rebar and the member uh, to make that rebar act composite with the member. Um, and then adding in the load. So the post tensioning, um, really, once the post tensioning is in this thing, is the first that it's seeing any load, really. Um, so I put in the post tensioning and the self weight at the same time. And the reason the self weight is uh, not acting on this until the post tensioning occurs is because we have the shoring towers holding up uh, this whole member up until you post tension it, then it lifts up off of the uh, formwork. Um, and then here I separate out aging, um, so I'm not adding anything or subtracting anything. So this all is the same. So the load groups that are active, boundary groups that are active, the nodes and elements that are active are all the same as in the prior stage. I'm just aging it for 14 days. And after 14 days, we're saying that the girder come, the girders come in. So with that, it's not changing any boundary conditions or elements, but we are adding the beam weight. So there's that. I have a duration of zero days because I like to separate out, um, you know, adding loads or um, you know, member or pieces to the member. Um, try to keep everything separate. Um, just to make sure it's uh, doing what I think it's doing. Um, so then, just working down this, it's um, all the different stages um, that I came up with during the design. So you're going to age the girders until the diaphragms are placed. You're going to place the diaphragm weight. The diaphragm has to um, set for a bit before they become active. Um, Yep, there should be a time step in there. Um, so then they become active there. And then you age the concrete until the deck is placed. So that's while they're putting up their formwork and tying rebar and everything. And then you put in the deck weight, then age it for some time, and then the deck becomes active, becomes a composite member with the straddle beam. And then you age the concrete some more, add your superimposed dead loads, add your live loads, add, um, then you age it for the long term, and then you put your live load back in. So I took the live load out, looking at the long term effects, because those are transient loads, right? So you don't want to um, include your creep and shrinkage and everything. You don't want to include your live loads in that. So here, I believe it should be that we are deactivating the live load. All right. So the model's already run. Um, didn't change anything, so my results are still there. So we'll just uh, run through some of the outputs that are available to you um, uh, for the next few minutes here, and then I'll take some questions. So um, first thing is we'll look at the beam stresses. So um, get over to the results and, stresses. and you have different options for what you can look at. You can look at beam stresses, you can look at beam stress diagram. So the beam stress is like a heat map, uh, gives you different colors for um, the level of stress throughout the member. Um, I like the diaphragm a little better because um, you can see your numbers a little better and uh, see the variation a little more clearly. And then you have uh, beam stresses for a pre-stressed concrete member. So this is uh, coming back to why I chose uh, to use a PSB member instead of just a typical member. Um, but first we'll look at the diagram, uh, the stress diagrams rather. Um, we'll start off by looking at the maximum stress within the entire member and show the values. So up here and down here is the rebar. So, you know, it has uh, fairly enormous stress compared to what you would expect to see in concrete. 
So um, since it isn't concrete, it's um, not too bad for the steel, the 60 KSI steel. Um, we can kind of get a better view of what's going on for the base structure here. Um, this shows our maximum compression along the entire length of this number. Um, and here we're actually a little beyond what the limit is. Um, there's some refinements that weren't made in this Midas civil model that I did have in my uh, spreadsheet, um, but still we're, we're pretty close um, there. If you want to see what the tension is, um, you can take a look at this box here. It shows you you have um, different points along the member, one, two, three, and four, and that'll show you where those points are if you go in your properties and look at your section properties. And for any given member, you have one, two, three, and four. In this case, I uh, entered everything to where there would be no torsion. So one and two are going to be identical, three and four are going to be identical. One thing to make note of is um, since for this inverted T portion, um, the member input was a regular T, so a right side up T. So nodes one and two are up here on the fat side. But in reality, those are at the bottom. So when I put the members in, I rotated that 180 degrees. So now one and two are at the bottom. So this is going to show stresses at the bottom, whereas this is showing stresses at the top. So here's our tension in the top of the end blocks and compression in the bottom of the T. As we go to three or four, we can look at tension in the, um, uh, tension in the top of the T and compression in the bottom of the flat or the um, um, rectangle, rectangular uh, portions at the end. And then you can watch how your stresses vary as you go through the construction stages. So, so long as you have summation selected, uh, that's going to be including everything. So um, that will include your losses and it will include um, all the loads that have been applied. So you can go through here and see how things vary over time. And then um, come to the very end after um, all of your uh, long-term losses. And you can put your life load back on. So this is your worst case. Uh, let's see. So this is top of the stem, worst case compression, 1.6 KSI. And then this is the bottom of the um, end blocks. And then you take a look at the flip side. We're a little bit into tension uh, through the middle there, but not too bad. And then um, it's all in compression aside from that. OK, I'm coming short on time, so I'll hurry up a little bit here. Um, so additional results you can look at are stresses here. Um, so you can have more points defined along a PSC member than you do um, some of the other members. And you can look at the different components of stress more clearly. So um, these are all different stress components that you can take a look at. Um, Another thing to show is tendon losses. Um, make that kind of convenient here. Um, as they're post-tensioning, they're going to want to know what our expected um, uh, elongation is of the tendon. So that's what they should expect to have um, you know, feed through as they stress to uh, full stress there. Um, this is probably from 0 to 100%. Um, when they actually do it, it's going to be 80% of that because they're going to stress to 20% and feed it and then uh, work through and do it. Um, so you got to uh, make sure you're accounting for that. Um, another post-tensioning output that I like, um, this shows you your losses <coughs> um, and basically your tendon force. 
as you run through your various stages. So over time, you can see how your losses are occurring. The reason for these blips is my rigid link in there, and those are um, only having much effect um, within that region, uh, within that uh, rigid link, essentially. Uh, so not too worried about that. Um, to get rid of that, you could model it just um, keeping the same uh, line of nodes and then changing where, um, I guess making sure your members are uh, entered to where you have an offset uh, with respect to the centroid. Um, so the software knows where your member is. Okay, so you can do that for all three of your tendons. Um, you can see the difference um, in how sharply uh, the angle changes. So here we have a fairly sharp change in angle. Here it's pretty flat, and D3 is flatter still. So those um, losses due to the turning the corner are pretty small for T3, fairly large for T1. All right. Another thing you can do in here is look at the flexion. Um, and again, you can look at that um, by stage. So that's a, a useful tool as you um, say you want to look at your uh, screed elevation. Well, since this is host tension uh, element, you're going to want to consider that um, uh, in your screed calculation to make sure you end up with the bridge where you think it's going to be.